Good morning, church. Good morning. I invite you to turn to Ephesians chapter 6 as you make your way back in. We're going to pick up in verse 5. For those of you I haven't had the opportunity to meet, my name is uh, Bart Lipscomb, and I get to serve as a pastoral intern here at Redemption Hill. Uh, and for those who we've been able to serve with over the years and months, and we've gotten oh, even over the last few weeks, uh, on behalf of Jessica and I, we just want to say how grateful we are for the last six months to be able to serve with you as a pastoral intern. It's a joy to be able to serve in this church, to serve alongside of John and Aaron and Mark. Um, and it's a joy. I also want to say thank you, especially to my wife, Jessica, for all that she does behind the scenes that you'll never see uh, on a week-in, week-out basis. So thank you. Ephesians chapter 6, we're going to begin at verse 5 and go through verse 9. It says, Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, as a, but as bondservants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or is free. Masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. Will you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we believe that this is your word. We believe this particular section of scripture you ordained before the world began to be, to be preached this morning, Lord. So we are your people. We're gathered in your name. We, we've sung your praises. Lord, I just pray that our hearts would be ready to receive your word, that you would do what only you can do, and you would take your word, and you would strengthen your people, and you would grow our faith, and you would apply it to our daily lives, the gospel, the good news of Jesus to our daily lives. And we pray that would be the outcome this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I want to start with a disclaimer. I feel like as I was preparing this message, I was sitting with you under it as well. So this message in particular hit me, uh, this passage, these verses hit me where I was this week. Um, and so by no means does this mean I, under, I figured all this out. It just means that I, this is a, it was a new perspective for me to continue to walk through. And I hope that's encouragement for you. Um, at my quote unquote day job, I serve as a project manager for a construction company. Uh, I have served in that role for about a little over five years. And if you don't know what project management looks like, um, I did want to kind of just give you project management 101. This is clearly written by someone who has been through project management for a long period of time. But even if you're not in that, in that field, you probably can relate to it. So there's six phases of a project that you're going to see here. The first phase is blind enthusiasm. Shortest lived phase of the entire project. It fades quickly into disillusionment which deteriorates further into just flat out panic. How are we gonna get this done? We don't have anything, you know, who signed us up for this? Which begins the next phase, phase four, search for the guilty, right? That ends in punishment of the innocent and every good project is capped off with rewards, accolades, and promotion for those who had nothing to do with it whatsoever. So you rinse that and repeat, and somehow you think next time it's going to look different. So you start over again at blind enthusiasm when you have a new project. So that's what project management looks like. You probably, in your own way, have experienced that on a daily basis, whether it be at work or in another, another realm. And, that, and if, if that is your experience, right, it's easy to begin to buy into this kind of idea, which, by the way, I see people taking notes about the six phases of a, <laughs> of a project. Uh, anyway, if that's your experience, it's easy to begin to buy into the cultural beliefs about our work. And I would say probably, if I, when I was sitting there, I was thinking about what are, what, are, what, am I, what are we told to believe about work? And two things started coming to mind, particularly in, uh, in America. The first is it's a drudgery to be survived, right? Everybody's working for the weekend. Monday through Thursday or throwaway days if I can just get to Friday. In fact, I get I got phone calls this week and I'd pick up the phone and say hello and the other end of the, on Friday I would get happy Friday. I got happy Friday on Wednesdays. 
people trying to just move the week along. Um, but it's a drudgery to be survived. Or, maybe even more dangerous, it's an identity to be lived. What you do, what your value is, is who you are. So your value is, is, is made up of the things that you do. Not, and, and what we're going to see this morning in our passage is how the gospel will answer both of those. Ultimately, the gospel is going to answer both of those cultural lies, those things that we, we ourselves can begin to believe. Your identity is found as a child of God, born again through the finished work of Jesus Christ. That is your identity. You're part of his church. That's your identity. That's your eternal identity. That's set in stone. And for that reason, for that reason, your work now matters. Monday through Thursday aren't throwaway days. Your work actually has real value. And, and what's interesting is your work has eternal, it has God-glorifying purpose. It's easy to see how John Piper's work has God-glorifying purpose. We see it on display on a weekly basis. It's easy to think of a seminary professor. It was easier for me this week to think of my sermon prep time versus the project management time as, okay, well, this is meaningful work. This has purpose, God's purpose, this work. And this over here, I'm just, same thing. I'm just trying to get through so I can get to the meaningful work. It was easy for that, that distinction to begin to be in my own head. But God has a purpose for your work. And we go about fulfilling that meaning, that purpose, in the way that he's, where he's placed us. And what we have are roles this morning that we're going to see in this passage. We're going to see in verses 5 through 8 the role of the servant, the, the one who serves. God has a purpose in that. We're going to see the role in verse 9 of the one, of the one in manager, the one that God has given authority to. God has a purpose in granting you that authority. And so the two, the two parts of this message are kind of broken up the way that Paul addresses, just like he's, the, the pattern that we've been seeing here at the end of Ephesians, towards the end of Ephesians. The first is this. We fulfill the role of service by believing our work is ultimately to the Lord. We fulfill our role of service by believing that our work is ultimately to the Lord. And so, that's in verses 5 through, through 8. Secondly, we fulfill our role as managers by remembering our master. You notice that both of them have the word by. We have to believe something in order to fulfill the purpose that God has for us where we are. The first is the role of service by believing that our work is ultimately to the Lord. Now, this is not a statement that somehow that we're going to earn some sort of merit before the Lord through our workaday world. Nothing that we can do at home, in the church, or in the office is going to earn us a place with the Lord. We can't bypass the gospel to present our works to the Lord. That road doesn't exist. There isn't a bypass around the gospel. The only reason we can even talk about our work having some sort of value is because of the ultimate finished work that's already happened. Our work is inside of that work. My greatest concern in preaching a message like this, what I consider an in-the-moment message, right? So these are in-the-moment instructions, rubber meets the road kind of thing. You have a decision to make, and the thought process can be, if I make the right decision, the God-honoring decision on Monday and Tuesday, he may be happier with me on Wednesday than he was on Sunday. That's not what he's saying here. You cannot work well without first resting in the gospel. You can't go to work in your office and work well without first resting in the gospel. The gospel is first priority in Ephesians for a reason. It comes first. You're, the gospel, what Christ has done for us, and all the blessings that came to us, your identity is established, and only then are the roles addressed. So that pattern is there, and it's important that we follow it. It serves as a solid foundation for us, and it's important we have to have that foundation because we're going to see right off the bat in verse 5 that the transformation of our service isn't automatically a transformation of our circumstances. Rather, it's a freedom granted in the midst of those circumstances. You notice here the first word is bond servants. Now, this is not Paul sanctioning uh, a slavery-type system. This isn't what Paul is saying here. He's merely addressing people where they are, where their station is in life. There were people who belonged to Jesus Christ, 
who happen to be in the role of bond servants. And so he takes the time to care for them and address them. He does not, remember, Paul himself is lacking his own freedom when he's writing this. He's in prison when he's writing this. And he takes the time to care for those who are also in the same position that he's in. And he doesn't think of them as less. Their station doesn't make them any less of a second-rate Christian or a third-rate Christian. In fact, by taking the time to address them, he's elevating them to an equal status within the church. You too have a purpose and a calling from the Lord. And what's surprising is we cross-reference this. He's careful to do this on a regular basis. And so this is not any sort of sanctioning of slavery. However, it is the message can still ring true to us. Even though we live in a free country, we've been blessed to have been born in a free nation. It, it does give us, if a bond servant's value, the Lord sees it, and there's value and purpose in the service that they're even doing, maybe to an unjust master, then how much more can we be assured there's value in what we do? There's purpose and meaning. The most mundane of, mundane of tasks, the lowest of stations, has unbelievable value when it is for the sake of the name of Jesus Christ. So employees, work as hard as you can for your boss. Players, have the best attitude you can for your coaches. Students, study your subjects intentionally, not just to check it off. Make your daily checklist a tool for the sake of Jesus Christ and for his kingdom. Use it to experience Jesus Christ and his goodness towards you. You can experience Christ in the middle of what you've been called to do on a daily basis at work. Use it to experience it. Use it to show his goodness to the world around you. And as we'll see, use it to gain true eternal reward. Paul begins to unpack some truths that start springing out of the gospel, right? This gospel has to be in place. And if the gospel is in place, then all these other things that we can believe can, are true as well. If the gospel is not in place, these things fall. So if you are in Christ and you've trusted in the gospel, these things are, are there to believe. They're promises for you. And the first that we see right off the bat in verse 5 is that your work situation, remember, your work situation is not eternal. He says, bond servants obey your earthly masters. It's a temporary setup. While a boss may have real say in your life, an earthly master does not have permanent nor do they have final say. Even an unjust boss, knowingly or not, is operating within the confines of a sovereign, loving father, your sovereign, loving father, who is working all things together for good. Either in time, they're limited either in time, eventually one day they won't be in that role, or in scope, they're only allowed to go this far. Whatever confines, they're the confines of the Lord. They're not final say. I think it's important to hear that because sometimes we feel like what have there is perfect example. We feel like our situation at work is is the all to end all. Like this is it. This is, this is everything rides on this. If I have a presentation on Wednesday, there is no Thursday. That's the final say in my life. There's be, we begin to kind of think and feel that way. And true, there are real outcomes. There are real circumstances that, but those things don't sit on the throne ultimately. Those things don't determine final decisions. You may be surprised at how much easier it is to give that presentation when you're aware that this is inside the sovereign hand of the Lord. You were, you were the person who was called for it. Also, we see another radical truth in this passage. We see that not only are we able to, are we able to see this as a temporary thing, even in the here and now, we're able to serve genuinely because as we see in verse 5, it says, Obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would who? Christ. Your service is ultimately to Jesus Christ. That's how you're able to ultimately serve genuinely on a day-in and day-out basis. You might like your boss. You might think you have a wonderful company that you work for. You bought them the mug that says world's greatest boss, that kind of thing. And, and you're extremely loyal to this person. They've been so good to you, and that's great. You may love them, but eventually that loyalty is going gonna, gonna to erode. It's going to begin to fade. And how do you stay motivated? How do you pick up the phone and return the call to an angry customer yet again? How do you mop joyfully mop the floor of the public bathroom at closing time? How do you go out there and uh, be the hardest practicing player on a week-in and week-out basis 
when there's very little chance you're ever going to get on the court. How do you keep doing that? How do you keep... It's not loyalty to a person that's ultimately going to carry you. It's going to be a love for Christ. It's going to be a remembering, as I mentioned before, it has to be out of a resting of the gospel. It's going to be a remembering of what he's done for you, a remembering that he himself is the one who is asking you to do these things. They're not the works that you do, that effort that you put in. Here's a temptation, and I have it too. You thought your thought process is if I work really, really, really hard and nobody notices, it goes into a black hole, into oblivion, and it doesn't matter anymore. It's another thing, item that I just crossed off the checklist. And I move on to the next item, and I move on to the next item. And if nobody sees it, nobody gives me a pat on the back, then there's really not any real value in it. It was just one more thing to get done. There's not any intrinsic value in the work itself. The value is given to it by other people. As Paul says, that's working by the way of eye service as people pleasers. Where we begin to believe that our work towards the Lord is ultimately only given value by people, and that's not the case. Pulled up on a job site this week, and now it's kind of what it looks like. This was, this crew was not our crew, thankfully. But there were two guys, and they had been left behind. Um, two guys in a backhoe. That may be sort of a joke. I don't know. But um, two guys, they're left behind, and they clearly were there to finish dressing the job up. The job was done. They were just supposed to clean it up, make it look nice, slick it off, so that when people took occupancy, you know, it would look professionally done. The boss and the rest of the crew had obviously moved on to the next important job, and here these two guys were left, clearly without supervision, to, uh, to finish up this work. So when I pulled up, one of them was leaning on a pedestal, had his phone scrolling. He did glance up to make sure I wasn't the boss. As soon as he realized that I didn't have their company logo on the side of the truck, he went back to scrolling on his phone. The other guy did attempt to show some sort of activity and then eventually gave up. It's like, this guy clearly doesn't have any authority over my life. So he gave up too, set the saw down, came over and just started scrolling on his phone. I never saw any meaningful work happen the whole time that I was on the job site. Now, if my truck had had that company logo, odds are productivity would have jumped tremendously and man, we're just hammering it out and getting it done. But that kind of working shows two things. One, it shows we don't really believe that the work itself has intrinsic value. The work itself isn't valuable unless people are looking at it. And secondly, clearly, hopefully this isn't the case long term for these guys, but it did show there's not a serving as unto the Lord here. There's not that desire to honor the Lord and, and what there is a desire, it's just eye service. Remember that Jesus only lived on this planet for 33 years. More than half of that time he was working as a carpenter. And we know very little about it. We know very little about it. We do know it was enough that he was considered an ordinary person by a lot of people. They're kind of amazed when his earthly ministry began. This is the carpenter's son? Clearly, Jesus, fulfilling the righteous requirements of the law fully in our behalf, worked as a carpenter. Work has meaning. There's value to a good day's work. Man was put in the garden to work it under direct guidance from the Lord, and, and hard work existed before bosses, and get this, before sin. In its purest form, obedience was simply and lovingly as unto the Lord. That's what Adam and Eve were able to experience before sin came into the world. How much greater, Paul goes on to explain, we have even a greater motivation. Because not only are, are, is our work unto the Lord we ourselves, look in verse 6, you are ultimately a bondservant of Christ. We're not to serve as people pleasers. Why? Because ultimately, you are a bondservant of Jesus Christ. Now, <clears throat> getting to work for that boss has its perks. Several of these perks start to come out in this passage and one of the things that, that comes right off immediately is he says, you're doing the will of God from the heart. This, is not, this does not mean that your current station, where you are right now, may be your final station in life. This is the only way that you're going to be doing the will of God. Nor does it mean that you're going to be doing it perfectly. That as soon as you get up, you're just going to nail it every time. That's not what he's saying here. What he's saying is tomorrow morning is not an accident. The sovereignty of God does not get lost in the details of your work. In fact, 
we can be assured, because we are bond servants of Jesus Christ, we can be assured here and now that God is weaving together one of the things that he's using all things together for good and to conform you to the image of Jesus Christ and all the things that are promised to us, we can be assured that in those details, one day we will see what God has put together. And our lives and someone else's lives will have overlapped on a regular basis of how God's used us. You are a bondservant of Jesus Christ, even at work. His glory will be revealed in that day. And you can be assured of that as you walk in on Monday. Secondly, second perk of working for this boss as a bond servant of Jesus Christ. You can fulfill this role of service working for Jesus Christ because you are doing good. Paul says in verse 7 and 8, he says, We're, we're rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, you are doing good. Maybe your work is to repair cars. You help, you, I say, all, all day, every day, I repair transmissions. Or somebody brings you a stack of papers this tall, sets it on your desk, you take the paper from the top of the stack, you start doing data entry, and you get down to this far, and you know what happens? Immediately, boom, here's another stack of papers, and you do this over and over again. This is what you do on a week-in and week-out basis. And there's begin the thought process, is this doing any good? Paul says, because you are a bondservant of Jesus Christ, you are doing good in your work. And there's at least two ways that we know that for sure. First, we know that because God designed the world for us to need someone else's work on our behalf, right? When my AC went out a few years ago, classic story, summertime comes around, the first hot day of summer, you turn on your AC and nothing happens. What's the first thing you want? I want somebody that knows how to fix an AC right away. I need that skill in my life today. And so you, when the guy pulls up and he says, oh yeah, I can fix that, you think, Bless you. You know, you are serving the Lord directly sent to us. Um, so you know you know that God has designed the world that way. And someone else needs your service as well. P- listen, people aren't paying for nothing. Someone else needs your service. You are doing good, rendering. You're, you're creating a good or a service that did not exist before you went in there and you went to work. You're doing good. So that's one way that we know that we can be assured that we're doing good. A second way is that you are reflecting the character of Christ. When you're in there and you're doing that on a weekly basis, Christ was a hard worker, and those who follow him should be reflecting that character. And to honor Christ is the highest calling that you have in life. Isn't that what it's all about anyway? That's why we're still here, is to reflect and honor him. And so that elevates the work that we're doing into this ultimate good, honoring Jesus Christ. And finally, maybe the most powerful truth to me personally in this passage is this, in verse 8. The perk of being a bondservant of Jesus Christ, fulfilling that role of service is this, the end. Verse 8, he says, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or is free. Paul says, you work for a gracious boss. I've served in a company before that had some form of a bonus structure program. We get to the end of the employees who who have, have done well for the company, gone the extra mile, worked hard. It seemed to still pain management to write a check at the end, almost like drudgery. We absolutely, I guess we have to pay these people. And so there was just this painful feeling it came it didn't come across as hey we're glad to pay these bonuses because you guys have you guys have killed it for us and we're we want to see it again next year there wasn't this enthusiasm it was kind of like a they're going to leave if we don't so i guess we got to pay them and uh that is not the situation that is not the structure that's not the boss that you serve in heaven that's you are a bond servant of jesus christ he is a gracious boss Paul says it doesn't matter who you are, whether you're at the top of the ladder, you're the very top rung, or you haven't even made it up to the bottom rung yet. You're still trying to figure out where the ladder is. It doesn't, Paul's saying it doesn't matter who you are. Look in the verse. He says it's a wide open guarantee, right? Whatever good anyone does, whether he is a bondservant or he is free, Paul's saying it's an open guarantee. In America, oftentimes hard work is rewarded. We're, we're blessed because of that. Paul isn't, but Paul isn't saying here, this isn't health and wealth gospel. He's not saying that, right? He's not saying that immediately if you start working this way as under the Lord, tomorrow all your problems are going to go away. 
And at the end of this deal, you may be a millionaire, possibly a billionaire, if you just keep going. That's not what he's saying, because clearly that's not the condition of his own life right now. He's in prison. So that's not what he's saying. But what he is saying. So oftentimes we take we can take that and say, okay, you know, if, if, if no health and wealth, and I'm guilty of this too. However, what he is saying is there still is a guarantee of a blessing for our soul. The work that you do, the blessing that God wants to pour out, you may be in this life, it may be the next, it may be in both. The work that you do, God wants to pour back on you in the best form possible for your soul. He is a wise and loving Heavenly Father. He delights for that work to come back to you, for that service to come back to you. And it will come back to you in the way that is best for your soul. Maybe if you worked hard and you you didn't get that high paying job that you thought, man, I worked hard enough. I should have gotten that. I should have gotten that position. Maybe he knows that your heart would have ran straight to the power and straight to the money and it would have been to your spiritual detriment. That does not mean that that hard work was for nothing. He knows maybe one day in heaven or maybe in this life, you'll be able to receive that gift for what it is, a gift from a loving, generous father that was bought for you through Jesus Christ. Listen, the reward that you will receive will cause you to delight and enjoy Jesus Christ. I cried yesterday when I was thinking about this. To come back, to receive this back from the kind hand of a loving Savior. Listen, he captured every moment that you have stooped to serve in a way that nobody noticed. He's captured every one of those moments. He hasn't lost a single one. And he delights to shower them back onto you is what this passage says. He delights to rain them back on you. Why? Because he has to know because that's who he is. That's his character. You work for a good boss. You are a bond servant of Jesus Christ. How gracious a Savior and how wonderful it is to know that all of our life, including work, is encapsulated in the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ. Tim Keller, who comments often on faith and work, he, he wrote a good book on that as well. He, his comment here, he says, Your Christian faith gives you a new spiritual power, an inner gyroscope that keeps you from being overthrown by either success, failure, or boredom. Regarding success and failure, the gospel helps Christians find their deepest identity, not in our accomplishments, but in who we are in Christ. This keeps our egos from inflating too much during seasons of prosperity, and it prevents bitterness and despondency during times of adversity. Truly, truly, we're able to fulfill the purpose of service, the role of service in our lives by believing ultimately that our work is under the Lord. It's not just a, it's not just a phrase, all is under the Lord. Whatever you do, under the Lord. It's not just a phrase. These verses have taught us a lot here. This is, this is real stuff. This is material stuff that we can depend on. These are truths that we're to believe on. So that's one role. Maybe you serve in that role. Possibly you serve also as a manager, the second role that we're going to talk about. We fulfill our role as managers by ultimately remembering our master. When we're granted authority, we're supposed to remember we too, just like the Roman centurion when we came to Christ, I too am a man under authority with those under me. Maybe you're middle management, maybe you're upper management, and you don't answer anybody. But we too, either way, we fulfill our roles as managers by remembering ultimately the true master. Remember Paul when he was Saul? He's the greatest example of this, right? Abuse of, un of unchecked power. Right in the middle of him having unchecked power. He'd gone in Acts, in Acts chapter 9 tells us that he'd gone to the high priest and he'd gone to the Jerusalem council and he'd gotten these letters that were basically, I can do whatever I want to do if I find you and you belong to Jesus Christ. This is unchecked authority. He's, going, he's headed to the synagogues in Damascus, and he's going to find whoever it is that belongs to Jesus, names the name of Jesus, and he has the authority unchecked without any sort of, I mean, our justice system checks him out. There's none of that. He can drag them back to Jerusalem apart from their family, maybe to never see them again, 
This is the kind of authority this guy has over people's lives. And he's going to take him to the Jerusalem council that had just presided over the stoning of Stephen, so there probably wasn't going to be a good ending for his use of authority. Acts 9 describes him as a man, get this, a man who was breathing threats and murder against the disciples. Breathing threats and murder. And now here he is saying, Masters, stop your threatening. Verse 9, he says, stop your threatening. How does a man go from a guy who is breathing threats, destroying people's lives, using unchecked power to ruin, kill, and destroy, turn into a man who uses, he still had authority, right? He still had authority on the other side of his conversion with Jesus Christ. He had authority in the churches, and yet now he is using this authority to build, to heal, to promote the name of Jesus Christ. The difference is when he, right in the middle of when he had unchecked power, and it clearly f had filled him with, with hate in his life, he meets a man who forgives him. He meets his ultimate master, and it changes who he is. It changes how he even sees the use of authority. Managers, the Bible says that you have an important role. You need to hear that. You have been granted authority for good as long as you too remember that you are a man under authority. Power is for service and to move others forward. Jesus displayed powerful ultimate authority while on earth, and his exercise of it was always for the good of others. It was always for the betterment of a situation. We need managers, we need teachers, we need coaches who recognize this. One spring, I served as a middle school football coach. I coached wide receivers. I was by no means a great coach. However, the guy who was the head coach was a great coach. He was also a Christian. You did things the right way every time on the practice field with this guy. You gave 100% and you did it the way he told you to do it. Kids had appropriate fear and trembling before coach. I mean, you know, it's, oh my goodness, coach, you know. There was appropriate fear. However, not a single kid on that field doubted if he loved them or he cared for them. Not a single kid on that field doubted if he didn't want their ultimate good. And he was using even discipline to encourage them and to strengthen them. They also knew, as, as kids in middle school, some of them were coming from rough situations, they also knew his door was open every time. If they needed to come talk to him about anything, they could. So he ran a tight ship, yes. However, even that, his strong leadership was ultimately a desire to serve these kids and get the best out of them. And they knew it. He knew his master was in heaven, and it showed. It was clear. We need people like that in positions of authority. We need people who use what God has granted them as a stewardship. They see it as a stewardship to bless others. It doesn't mean that you don't have discipline, as I mentioned. It doesn't mean you don't have expectations in a workplace. Listen, abdicating authority, just trying to figure it out as we go, no structure, that doesn't serve anybody. That isn't what God called you to. Be strong enough in the Lord to prayerfully make the best decisions you can and know that they're right as best you can, as best as you can. You don't know it, everything all the time, but as best you can, make the best decision. Don't let numbers, don't let your ego, and don't let outward perception change what you think is the right thing to do, the right decision to make. Exercising God-given authority while acknowledging His authority is truly a service unto the Lord and a service unto those that serve unto you. You need to hear that this morning because... The position of authority oftentimes can be a lonely position. You may have employees or an employee who's complaining about a direction that you've led, that is choice that you've made or a direction that you led everyone in. They may not see the whole picture. They may not be able to understand all the factors that went into you, and you don't have time to sit down and explain it to them. So those folks may be complaining to you. If it's wrong, you'll never hear the end of it. If you made the wrong decision, if it's right, well, that's what he's supposed to do anyway. We'll just move on to criticizing the next decision. You also bear the burden of bills. you got to pay the bills. And unrelentingly, on a weekly basis, payroll. That just seems, that probably would be what I would say would be the, the maybe the ultimate burden a lot of people feel. you got to make payroll every week. Maybe the people that were complaining about you on Thursday are coming looking for a paycheck on Friday. Got to make sure it clears. Your heavenly master placed you in that position as a conduit for their good 
and to reflect a gracious authority, reflect his gracious authority. Doing that can be hard. Oftentimes, there's a temptation to begin to rule out of fear. Just iron fist, my way or the highway. That's not what we're called to here. We're called to authority, yes, but gracious authority. And finally, remember this, the ultimate responsibility isn't on you anyway. The folks under your authority have a Lord too, and while you may have the, be, be the privilege, you may have the privilege of being the tool that God uses to give them their livelihood, their livelihood, just like yours, finally comes from the hand of the Lord. Look, look in verse 9, it says, Knowing that he who is both what their master and yours is in heaven, and that there is no partiality with him. At the end of it all, working as a leader, you're in the same position as those under you. You're having to look to the Lord. You're accountable to the Lord, just like they are, in the same way. And your hope is in Him, just as theirs is. So finally, the role of Christian manager, the role of Christian employee, Christian worker, while functionally they're different, they, they look different on a day-in and day-out basis, different calling, different responsibilities, different tasks. They look different, but functionally they're different. At the same time, they end in the same place. They end in meaningful, God-honoring, gospel-saturated, full of purpose work. And either way, there isn't a higher calling than that. Whether you're in this role or that role, there isn't a higher calling than being able to forgive, fulfill that. Listen, you're gonna if you're in that if you're in that world, you're gonna spend most of your precious waking hours majority of your hours for a lot of people i mean if you were around the room and you start talking about the number of hours in a week i imagine 40 you get into 50 some people would say 60 some people would say i'm i'm, I'm starting to move bumping on towards 70 that happens you're gonna spend most of your waking hours fulfilling this calling more than anything else it's vital we allow the truths of ephesians 6 to redeem that time to begin to give us the purpose in that meeting. Paul has already said you have to make the most of the time because the days are evil. And so we look at our time and we start to think, well, how does the gospel approach that? How does the gospel deal with this particular part of my time? It doesn't just stop. It, we have to bring the gospel to bear into those hours because we have to make the most of those hours because the days are evil. Finally, a few that leads us to a few practical words of advice as we begin to, to conclude. The first is this. Your work environment is probably... The most worldly place you're ever going to step into. You are a citizen of Jerusalem, and even if you have a Christian boss, odds are you're going to be walking into Babylon. It's not a coincidence that Paul begins the next set of verses talking about spiritual warfare. You can't just wake up and assume that you're going to walk out unscathed when you walk into Babylon. Whether I mean, you look at the lives of Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and you start thinking about what it means to be a Jew in exile, be a Christian called into, into a foreign land. Your environment is probably going to be the most worldly place. And it's easy to begin to believe that way. It's easy to begin to think, man, this is a drudgery to be survived. Man, this really, this really is who I am. What I do is who I am. Don't allow that to happen. Secondly, another word of advice, your interactions with coworkers, customers, managers, and bosses, or employees, rather, will often be opportunities to adorn the gospel with God-honoring words and actions. You may have a coworker who has no interest whatsoever in coming to hear a message about the forgiveness of Jesus Christ until he wrongs you and then experiences your forgiveness towards him. He may think, that's what I've been missing. That's what I need in my life. Your interactions with coworkers, you, they are opportunities. Your work is full of them, probably on a daily basis. Opportunities to honor the Lord with God-honoring words, attitudes, and actions. Third, if work has become your identity, if you're saying, man, it really kind of is an idol in my life. If you took this away from me, I don't know who I am anymore. This is my identity. 
Know this, there is a gracious God that you can trust and that real joy, true experiencing, lasting joy is in knowing Him. It's not in being the next big thing. If you're like me and you sitting under this passage and you're thinking, man, I fail at this. I haven't honored the Lord in what I said this past week. My attitude wasn't necessarily greatest Wednesday at whatever time. I just, I fail. I fail all the time. You can come to Jesus this morning for forget, for forgiveness. And he will gladly begin to help you see work differently tomorrow than you did on Friday. Doesn't mean it's going to be perfect. It means it's going to be a progress, right? But you can be assured that God is at work in your heart. He's at work when you're at work. It's not just lost time. As I mentioned before, filed into oblivion. And finally, make the most important priority of your life knowing Christ. Remember, what does it profit a man if he climbs the corporate ladder, if he makes it to the top, if he's in, everyone knows his name, if he gains the whole world and yet loses his soul. Don't allow that to happen at work. God has a purpose for your work. Your, I mean, a real purpose. Not just a try to be nice purpose, but a real purpose, a real plan. You can be assured of that. If you feel this morning that I'm, I'm kind of on my own, I'm kind of adrift, and I don't sense God's guidance. I used to, I just don't sense, I don't feel it this morning. Be encouraged. Paul's saying to you this morning, I, I want you to hear, there's a purpose and a plan that God has for you. Whether you're in the role of service and you're able to serve him in that way, or you're in a role of a manager, it is a high calling. And don't allow, don't allow the years to begin to chip away at that conviction. Don't allow the culture to begin to move those, move you away from that. God has a plan. He's fulfilling it in Jesus Christ. You, your identity is in Christ Jesus. You were saved for and you were left on this earth for a reason. God is using you. And so be encouraged this morning. If you're the manager and you're carrying that burden, be reminded again today ultimate burden belongs to the Lord Jesus. He carried our, he daily carries our burdens is what the scripture says. Come to him daily. He will graciously give you rest. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do confess how oftentimes, at least I confess, how oftentimes we fall short of honoring you the way that you deserve. Your son, Jesus, deserves our work. And yet we lack the power, we lack the ability to do it. Lord, would you just allow us first and foremost, even through the rest of this day and as we go into tomorrow, that it wouldn't be a busied, hurried, scattered time, Lord. But that ultimately it would be a rest in you. Refreshed in your goodness to us. Refreshed in your promises from your word that we can trust you. We can trust you in every situation. You are our good master. Lord, I just pray you would strengthen your church this morning for that which you've called them to this week. Would you do some, something just only your spirit can do? Would you take your word? Would you apply it to specific circumstances, specific instances as they come, Lord, as, as, as whatever doubts may come, as whatever fears may begin to creep in, as whatever fatigue comes in, Lord, I pray that you would answer them this week. Your Holy Spirit would say, no, that's not true. You belong to Jesus Christ. Your work has a plan, and all things will work for, for your good and for his glory. And Lord, I just pray that you would send out your church to accomplish much good, and that you would use our work even to draw others into saving faith in Jesus Christ. We lift high the name of Jesus. 
We lift high the name of Jesus. And in his precious name we pray. Amen. Before we dismiss, I'd like us to take a moment in application. And here's what I'd like us to do. Um, I, I'd like us to pray uh, for those that are either over us or under us. So many of us might have both roles um, in, in different capacities and so forth. Um, but if that's you, if you work with people, either that you serve under or that you serve over, um, I'd like just to pray for those people right now. Particularly what's a burden on my heart is that we would pray, those of us that have a boss, that we would pray for our boss right now. I think it'd just be glorifying to God. And then I want to do that first, but I also, as we do that, there may be some here that the point that Bart made about every moment of work is recorded by the Lord. And you might not be in a paying job right now. You might be in a different kind of work that you're doing. Um, but I, I, I want you, if that's you, uh, to also meditate on God's chronicling of your work. There's never been a wasted moment of work in your life. Every moment of work you've ever done, in any role, he has recorded. And he looks forward to celebrating that work in return towards you. So if that struck you, I'd like you just to enjoy the good news of that right now. Receive in a fresh way the assurance that he sees every work. But for those of us that are currently in a, in a position where this would be relevant, let's take a minute and just, just pray for either employees or boss. Just pray for them for a few moments. Lord Jesus, I pray for grace right now to look forward to tomorrow morning. I pray for the grace to adorn your gospel in our work, in our labors. Lord, we have people that labor at home, people that labor in an office, people that labor outside, people that do good in a myriad of ways in this church that serve other human beings with what they produce, what they think through, how they strategize. Lord, we pray, Lord, that you would give all of us the grace to look forward to tomorrow, to look forward to Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday, that we would, we would not merely look forward to the times we have off of work, but the times we have in work to bring glory to you. And we do pray for those that work around us. You would give us the privilege of adorning the gospel this very week. Help us to do that, Lord, with joy and gladness. Sustain and comfort those weary in their work. Protect those facing any injustice at work. Restore those, Lord, who are lacking in work. We entrust this area to you. We ask for your provision, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.